we good? Good morning. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Good morning. And welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I am Council Member Francisco Moya, uh, the chairperson of this uh, subcommittee. And today we are joined by uh, Council Member uh, Lansman, Reynoso, Rivera, Torres, and Grudenchek. Uh, also, uh, we have Council Member uh, Cohen uh, in attendance. Uh, if you're here to testify on the citywide uh, M1 hotel special permit zoning text amendment, uh, LU uh, 259, please uh, fill out a white slip with the uh, sergeant at arms. Um, and due to the number of people who are uh, wishing to testify, uh, we are going to give uh, each speaker uh, two minutes for those that are uh, signing the um, sheets. Uh, and now, uh, before we begin the hearing, uh, we will vote on applications that were the subject of a prior hearing. Uh, this morning, we will vote uh, to approve LUs 250, 251, uh, and 252, the St. Michael Cemetery Park Elimination and Cemetery Land Acquisition applications for property uh, for property at 72-02 uh, Astoria Boulevard in Councilmember Constantinides' district in Queens. Uh, in these applications, the city, uh, the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation is the applicant for an amendment to the city map to demap a portion of St. Michael's Park. Uh, Parks is also the applicant for a zoning map change to apply a zoning district designation to the demapped property. Uh, St. Michael Cemetery is the applicant for the council's approval uh, pursuant to the New York State uh, not-for-profit corporation law uh, to acquire this land for cemetery purposes. These actions will facilitate the expansion of the existing cemetery. Uh, we will also vote to approve with modifications LU uh, 253, uh, the Hebrew home application for a special permit to allow a long-term care facility use in an R1 uh, one district in Riverdale in Council Member Cohen's district in the Bronx. Uh, the long-term uh, care facility special permit would facilitate the development of a continuing care retirement community, in including in total 388 independent living uh, dwelling units for seniors. Our modifi uh, modification will establish a designated buffer area, ensuring that only the proposed continuing care retirement community is built in the R11 portion of the zoning district. And uh, before I continue, I just want to turn it over to Councilmember Cohen for some uh, brief remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just really wanted to thank everybody for a tremendous amount of hard work that has gone to get us to this point. City planning for their hard work. I have many advocates in the community, the Nature Preservancy, the neighbors at Sigma Place. Uh, Michael Wald has been a, a really a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Dan Rheingold. Uh, the land use staff, uh, Jeff, Julie, Amy, Raju, really uh, held my hand. This been, has been going on since before I came to the council. So uh, I am very, very pleased uh, that we came up with a thoughtful uh, compromise that really uh, serves the needs of the community uh, and, and the Hebrew home well into the future. So with that, I encourage my colleagues to vote aye. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Um, we will also vote to approve LU uh, 254, the second amendment to the Coney Island Special Process Agreement for property in Council Member Traeger's district in Brooklyn. This application submitted by the New York City Economic Development Corporation is to amend an agreement signed in uh, 2009 establishing a uh, process for development of the Coney Island amusement area. This amendment is regarding the addition of properties which are either uh, DMAP street ends or were acquired by the city through eminent domain and will become part of an amusement area. This property will eventually be mapped as parkland. Uh, I will now uh, call for a vote to approve LUs 250, 251, 252, and 253, and to approve, I'm sorry, 254, uh, and to approve with modifications uh, I have described LU's, uh, LU uh, 253. Council, uh, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Aye and all. Lansman. Reynoso. About aye. Rivera. Aye. Torres. Aye. 
Great handshake. Aye. Uh, the land use items are approved by a vote of six in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee. And we'll leave the vote open. We will, we will now uh, start our hearing on LU uh, 259, the citywide M1 hotel text amendment submitted by the New York City Department of City Planning for an amendment of the zoning resolutions for uh, the city of New York. Uh, the text amendment would create a special permit uh, for new hotels, motels, uh, tourist cabins, and boatels in M1 district uh, citywide with a few exemptions. Uh, we will now start our hearing on LU 259, the citywide M1 hotel text amendment uh, submitted and proposed to amend would create the requirement for developers to secure a special permit in order to develop a hotel in M1 district requiring, districts requiring a full ULERP public review, including city council approval. Since 1961, hotel development has been allowed as of right in most commercial and M1 light manufacturing districts across the city. As we will hear from the Department of City Planning, uh, the growth in New York City tourism over the past decade has sparked a hotel building boom with nearly uh, 35,000 new hotel rooms developed since uh, 2010. As hotel development has increased, it has pushed further into M1 light industrial districts, resulting in increasing conflicts with industrial businesses that generate noise, uh, traf uh, truck traffic, truck traffic, loading, uh, pollution, and other uh, impacts. In M1 districts with a more mixed and commercial character, such as those in Manhattan, the increase in hotels has led to a change in community character to tourist-oriented development and has often resulted in buildings that are set back uh, from the street wall. It, the new special permit requirement would allow hotels in these M1 areas to proceed only uh, a case-by-case -case basis subject to public review. Hotels would continue to be allowed as of right in C districts and MX districts throughout the city. I know many of my colleagues have worked very hard on ensuring that we update our manufacturing zones uh, our manufacturing zone strategy to reflect our priorities in 2018 as opposed to uh, 1961, and this proposal has been a council priority for some time. Uh, I don't think our job is done here, uh, and I look forward to continuing to work as a council to protect uh, and strengthen our industry areas because of uh, the middle class jobs that they provide and because of their role uh, in our city's uh, economy. The council is also mindful that uh, this is a highly sensitive, uh, highly significant change in development policy, uh, and we have carefully uh, been reviewing the record of uh, community board, uh, borough president, and other uh, public feedback. And we look forward to hearing from the Department of City Planning uh, on, and the public on this important proposal. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, and I now would like to call uh, Jennifer uh, Gravel uh, and Jack Jacqueline uh, Sun Hu. Did I say it correctly? Thank you. Um, can I ask you to start? Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. Council, if you can please. Uh, good morning, Chair Moy and Council Members. Uh, my name is Jennifer Gravel. Well, one, um, one second, I just, uh, Council, if you could please swear in the panel. Thank you. Okay, before responding, um, please state your name again. And um, if you're, make sure your red button, red light is on the mic. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. And just state your name again for the record. Jennifer Gravel. Jacqueline Sunwoo. And do you swear or affirm to answer truthfully and give truthful testimony? Yes. Thank, thank you. You may begin. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya and Council Members, for um, having us here today to present the uh, proposed zoning text amendment to create a new City Planning Commission special permit for new hotel developments in light manufacturing districts. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Jackie Sun Wu, who has been the project manager in taking this uh, through the public process and through the referral to all 59 community boards. 
Um, and I'll let Jackie do a brief presentation to explain the background and um, some specifics of what we're proposing. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Um, so good morning. I'm here to present a citywide zoning text amendment that is currently under the consideration by the city council. Um, this proposal would require a special permit for new hotels in light manufacturing or M1 districts citywide. Um, the city planning commission voted favorably on the proposal on October 17th. Since 2010, we've seen a lot of new hotels open in M1 districts citywide, um, and they've generated some concerns amongst communities. Therefore, this proposal here is aiming, one, to achieve balanced neighborhood growth, and two, to ensure sufficient opportunities remain to support industrial, commercial, and institutional growth in New York City. I will very briefly explain the background of this proposal to remind us all why we are here today. The M1 Hotel Tax Amendment originated from the 10-point Industrial Action Plan, which included a special permit for new hotels and industrial business zones, or IBZs, only. As we were studying the issue, however, um, we found that there were a broader set of concerns that affected all of the M1 districts. In the past few years, New York, New York City's tourism industry has really boomed, and the robust visitors numbers led to strong demand for hotels. Consequently, there's been increased hotel development in these areas, and um, these M1 areas vary widely in character, ranging from areas that still retain a lot of industrial activity to the areas that are more mixed use in character. But hotels in these areas could result in land use conflicts by creating unsafe conditions and nuisance. In the more actively industrial areas, businesses generate noise, truck traffic, and um, loading that can conflict with hotels. And in the more mixed-use M1 districts, hotels can de um, detract from opportunities for other uses. And as you can see from these photos, they typically tend to be out physically out of context as well. So due to these reasons, we are proposing a zoning tax amendment to establish the City Planning Commission special permit for new hotels, motels, tourist cabins, and motels in M1 districts. We believe that a case-by-case, site-specific review process is necessary to ensure that hotels are built only on appropriate sites. The special permit would apply to all commercial, district, uh, commercial hotels in M1 districts citywide. In orange are the areas where hotels would be subject to a special permit, and in blue are the areas where hotels could still develop as of right. So in granting a special permit for new transient hotels, the commission must find the following that's listed on this slide here. One, that the proposed site plan for the project shows that it'll minimize potential conflicts between the hotel and the adjacent uses. Two, that the site plan also demonstrates that the street wall location and the design not impair the character of the existing streetscape. Third, that the hotel will not cause undue traffic and congestion in the area. And lastly, that the proposed project will not impair the character of the surrounding area. Furthermore, hotels existing on the date of adoption will be considered conforming use, but an enlargement of a hotel that wishes to increase the floor area by 20% or more will have to go through a special permit process. Further, a hotel development that had a building permit from the Department of Buildings by or on April 23rd will be vested. And from the date of adoption of the text, these vested projects have three years to complete construction or receive a certificate of occupancy. In addition, we will not require a special permit for hotels that are operated exclusively for a public purpose for housing assistance. This means that the rules, <coughs> excuse me, that rules of citing homeless facilities will not change and will continue to be as of right as it is today. Um, if this proposal is enacted, every new hotel in the M1 district would have to apply for a special permit, which is a discretionary action. This includes a full Euler process with community board review, borough president review, city planning commission review, and usually this um, council can take up on to vote. Um, the total length of the process is typically almost two years. And that concludes my presentation, and we will open it up for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, just a couple of questions. I also just want to uh, acknowledge that uh, we've been joined by uh, Chairman Salamanca, uh, the Chair of Land Use, uh, for this hearing. Thank you, Chairman, for uh, being here. Um, can you uh, explain uh, more about the conflict, 
conflicts between the hotels and industrial businesses uh, that we've been seeing in the heavy industrial areas and how does the presence of a new hotel on a heavy industrial block affect, uh, affect those businesses? Do you want to take that one, Jack? Sure. Um, as I briefly explained, in the heavy, more heavier industrial areas, they generate a lot of nuisance and um, things, get, things that can be harmful to the tourists um, who are staying in the hotels. And on the other flip side of that too, the um, hotel business can actually um, harm the e efficiency of these businesses. And these include things like traffic, um, congestion, um, noise that can actually um, affect the relationship of the different uses in the industrial business zone. Are there uh, commercial uses other than hotels that uh, also create similar, similar conflicts? I would, I would say so, but um, I think hotels have a lot of, um, especially when it comes to foot traffic or um, trans auto traffic, I think it creates a lot more nuisance to the businesses than other, for example, office uses or other commercial uses that have less heavier foot traffic. So, uh, you know, I'm just going with, with, with what you had talked about before and how it creates nuisances. So why not also uh, restrict a, a large format uh, for eating and drinking and, interest and entertainment establishments as well. Yeah, we have heard questions about this before. Um, we haven't seen the widespread development of large format eating and drinking establishments in the M1 districts as we, as we have seen the widespread development of hotels. Um, so, it, and there's also, unlike hotels, large format eating and drinking establishments themselves also create nuisances and impacts that we wouldn't necessarily want in residential areas. Um, so we do see them as sort of an appropriate thing in an M zone, and we haven't seen them come into these areas in the way we've seen hotels. So the, the special permit currently would require developers to show that a hotel would not uh, impair the essential character uh, of an area. Uh, how does city planning define essential character? We don't define essential character. It's really context-based. Um, in, in a neighborhood where most of the activity is heavily industrial, um, that would be the essential character. But the M1 districts, by and large, are pretty diverse places. Um, in, in some places, they are very mixed. Um, and if the, there are situations where a hotel would not be in conflict with the essential character. Um, but we, the whole purpose here is to give discretion both to the Planning Commission and to the City Council to make decisions that are uh, appropriate for that neighborhood where the development is happening. So, uh, okay, uh, we've heard from uh, some borough presidents and council members that uh, uh, we should look at strengthening the consideration for conflicts with uh, industrial businesses in uh, the findings of the special permit. Uh, did you consider language to strengthen uh, the consideration for industrial character? We, we were asked to try to think about can, specifics to, to try and strengthen that. Ultimately, because the neighborhoods are so diverse, we wanted to leave enough discretion to the council and the commission to be able to use their judgment on what was most appropriate. Uh, how have hotels impacted uh, M1 areas in Manhattan where the neighborhood character is more commercial? Um, the, the, the M1 dis their M16 districts are the most of the M1 districts in Manhattan. Um, there has been a pretty significant amount of hotel development, um, particularly on the west side. Um, and this is, has made some of these areas evolve in ways that weren't anticipated. I think the expectation was that these areas would be more mixed commercial. Um, and now the, most of the new development that we have seen in a lot of these places has been hotel development. And uh, it is the hope that, that we could see a bit more diversity in the types of, of economic activity that's happening in those places. Um, so maybe you can explain this a little bit more, but um, why, why did uh, DCP decide to exempt the MX mixed industrial residential districts uh, like those in Long Island City uh, 
uh, from the special permit. Sure. Uh, well, the mixed-use districts are mixed-use. Um, they're intended to really have a mix of residential and commercial activity. For the most part, we're not seeing lots of hotel development in mixed-use districts. Um, for the most part, we feel it's, a, it's appropriate in those places. Um, they are places where there is a mix of, of residential and, and commercial and industrial activity. Um, and we see hotels as, as, as appropriate in those places. So in areas like Long Island City, you're saying that you don't, that you don't see that there's been uh, a real increase in hotel development where it's been a mixed use? It's my understanding that most of the hotel room in Long Island City is happening not outside the MX district. There's some of it had happened in the MX district prior to it having been mapped. Um, but there are more hotels in Long Island City. Um, it is a location where there is good access to Midtown. It makes, it's a, it's a sensible place for hotels. Um, so we, we think it's appropriate there. Okay. Um, we've heard some concerns that if this proposal is approved, developers uh, might not be able to keep up with the demand for hotel rooms as tourism continues to grow. Uh, what the city, uh, what what the city planning's analysis uh, show on this issue? Um, sure, um, our we did a market study on the tourism industry and the hotel development in New York City, and what our analysis actually showed was that um, the supply and demand for hotels will actually come to a plateau in the next few years. Um, and existing um, supply of hotels in, in New York City right now will actually be able to meet the demand um, despite the growing tourism industry. Thank you. Uh, we've also heard some uh, confusion from property owners about the vesting provisions. Um, and I was just hoping that you could explain in as clear uh, and simple language uh, as possible uh, the different provisions that apply to a developer who pulled permits um, for hotel construction before the date of uh, 423.18 versus a developer who pulled permits after uh, 423.18. Sure. Um, the vesting provision that is under this proposal here, as you mentioned, is um, if a developer obtained a building permit um, or, or a partial permit from the Department of Buildings before or on April 23rd, which was our date of referral, then they will be vested and have three years to complete construction or receive a certificate of occupancy. Alternatively, um, a developer has an option to um, abide by the standard vesting rules under the zoning resolution, which is that you would have to complete the foundations by the date of adoption of the text. Right. If that so, makes sense. Uh, but is this a, a typical practice of uh, city planning to establish the date of certification uh, for 2318 as the cutoff? for uh, special vesting provisions? It's not, it's not typical. Um, it, 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 we have there, done this before. Um, it, it happened, has often happens at the council. Um, we, in, this, in this instance, there were a number of, the scope of the project was very broad, um, and there were a number of, of, of pro projects that were pretty well advanced in the development process where this would be a significant hardship and there were a high likelihood that they would go to the BSA. Um, had we not done allowed to sort of the slight liberalization of the policy. Um, we set the date at the date of referral as opposed to sometimes you see the date of adoption um, in order to prevent a sort of rush on DOB. Um, so it sort of stopped the clock basically at, at the date of referral of the text amendment. Okay. Um, the proposal includes uh, an exemption for, facilitate, for facilities operating um, exclusively for the public uh, purpose of temporary uh, housing assistance. Uh, what is temporary housing assistance and how does this uh, differ from the long-term uh, shelters? Temporary housing assistance is, is a, a long-term long shelter um, or, a, or a shelter that can can be used um, so transiently. It's, it's so in the, in the purpose here, so if, it, if it's a hotel, 
um, used by the Department of Homeless Services. Um, it would have to, the, the stays in the facility could not, from my understanding, be longer than 30 days. Um, so it is an exemption for the siting of shelters. Under the proposal, any new shelter cited here would have to be purpose-built as a shelter and not as a commercial hotel, if that makes sense. I realize it's a little bit confusing. But. So we were, I thought we were moving away from the sort of use of hotels as shelters. Um, and are we saying now that, so the temporary housing assistance is the same thing as the uh, long-term shelters? The temporary housing assistance, th so this proposal, the city planning special permit was a response to concerns, land use concerns that we um, had, had been hearing and responding to in commercial hotels. The proposal does not intend to affect the, depart the current policies and, and practices with regard to siting of shelter facilities. And it's my understanding that Department of Homeless Services has a policy of moving away on contracts with commercial hotel providers. Um, but they have, in order to meet their mandate, federal, their right to shelter mandates, have needed the flexibility to site facilities within light manufacturing districts. Um, and this will continue to retain that flexibility um, while, the, while the department continues to implement its strategy to eventually shift away from using commercial hotels. Okay, uh, until now, uh, what we've primarily seen in the uh, industrial areas is uh, tourist uh, hotels uh, partially or fully converted to temporary housing assistance. Uh, this exemption would be different in that it would allow only purpose-built facilities for uh, temporary housing assistance. Is that, is that correct? For new construction, for a newly constructed building, that's correct. Or a newly converted building, I should add. Got it. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to now uh, turn it over to uh, Chair Salamanca for a few questions. Thank you, Chair Moya. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first, I want to commend Department City Planning um, on this tax amendment. Um, I am really excited about what we're about to um, uh, vote on in a few in a few weeks on. Um, I, I feel that this tax amendment will empower communities. Communities will be able to decide if a hotel should be built in their industrial zone or an M1 zone. I, for one, have two IBZs in my district that have the Hunts Point community, and I also have Port Morris. Mm -hmm. um, Hunts Point is, is shared, you know, with industrial and residential. And uh, the concern, the fear that we've always had in the Hunts Point community is that we will get a Hashi's hotel built in our community because mm -hmm. at the time they can build as of right. Um, and we have struggled in the Hunts Point community with prostitution. Um, but now we know that this fear will no longer be there because we will be able to decide mm -hmm. should we allow a hotel operator to develop in Hunts Point or not, and as well as, as, as in Port Moore. So I commend you and I thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I share some of the concerns that Chair Moya, that Chair, um, Chair Moya has, um, and I just want to just speak a little bit on them, and that is the exemption for the homeless shelters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have communities such as mine who is overburdened with, with homeless shelters. I have anywhere between 36 to 40 homeless shelters in my district. While there are other communities, other colleagues um, that have none. Um, and so I, I strongly felt that as part of this tax amendment, homeless shelters should not have been exempted from build, you know, be, being able to build in an M1 zone or an industrial zone. Um, I understand that that's the position that the, administ the administration is taking a different position. They want to exempt the homeless shelters. Um, so can you explain why uh, did the administration take that position? The, um, there's a, the, the city is obligated to provide shelter to, to, to individuals and families who, who, who need a bed. Um, and I, they, they have, as out of necessity, been, Citing families in 
in man light manufacturing districts. Um, they don't have a lot of options on where to site shelters. Um, there, there are, in historically, it was for, for decades, that, that having the flexibility to do the light manufacturing zone has enabled them to do some of that. Um, because this proposal was, this City Planning Commission special permit was really about addressing concerns with commercial hotels, um, we did not want to affect existing policies on, on shelter siting, um, and, and certainly the separate agency would, is, is the steward of that policy. Um, and so we, we are doing our best to sort of hold harmless what they are um, attempting to do and, and trying to address what is a very, very challenging problem. Now, uh, should the tax amendment pass as written and the shelters are excluded, um, can you explain the process of a developer building a shelter? Uh, is the shelter going to be built a, a hotel style type of shelter where there's no kitchens in their rooms? Um, then what should happen should a, a property owner get a permit from DHS, have their shelter there, five years down the line they may lose that contract with DHS, can they convert that building into a hotel? Can you explain that entire process? Sure. So if you have a scenario, you have a property owner um, who, who wants to, to build a, a shelter. So they, they have to have a written agreement and contract with DSS or other agencies that provide emergency shelters, it's almost always DSS, um, Department of Social Services. Before DOB can issue a permit for that, they have to submit the letter that that attesting to the fact that they have this agreement with the city. Um, and then they can build the shelter um, pursuant to the building codes for a, a hotel. Which is not, they would not be allowed to rent those rooms to the general public. It couldn't be operated as a commercial hotel. It could only be used for the purpose of temporary housing assistance or for shelter purpose. Um, because it's a light manufacturing zone, we don't allow residential units. Um, there are other models of developing shelters under as a, as a community facility, a nonprofit with sleeping accommodations. Um, it's a separate building code. Uh, manufacturing districts don't allow this kind of development, um, which is why they're filed as hotels um, and is somewhat confusing. Um, but in, in which case it would have to be used transiently and built to building codes for hotels. But the hotel itself could not be used as a commercial hotel. Um, in a scenario where, for whatever reason, the operator loses its contract to provide the, the service, and another operator doesn't step in and, and renew that contract, um, they would have a couple options. Um, one would be to convert to another conforming use they could come to get a city planning commission special permit to do a commercial hotel, so they'd have to go through the entire process. So if they wanted to then convert it to a day's in, for instance, they couldn't do that without going first to the city planning commission and then to the, the, the city council for approval. Um, and so just to be clear, there are no loopholes for a developer to build a shelter should they get approval or a contract, then should that contract expire or get canceled there are no loopholes where they can go to the BSA or something where they can get a special permit from another city agency that would allow them to operate as a hotel. There are no other approvals that we've put into here that, that would allow them to do that. Now, a, a property owner who has a, a variance case can always go to the BSA if, if they have a unique financial hardship. Now, that's, so that, that is for any property owner theoretically an option, but but so the BSA can grant them a special permit should no, they have not a financial a special, hardship? No, there's no, new, there's no new BSA special permit, but there, the Board of Standards and Appeals has a process for a variance that any property owner in the city can avail themselves of if there's no, if they can demonstrate that there's no reasonable financial return on, on the property. It's, it's a pretty high bar to, to meet that finding. Um, so this is, this is not a process that we're creating through this. It's, it's an existing process that every property owner in the city All right. has a right to. Thank you. Right to. But I want to continue to have conversations. I still have concerns. You know, um, as Jim Moya mentioned, uh, I was also, I, I was too under the impression that the city is moving away from the model, the shelter model of uh, a shelter style, uh, hotel style shelters. Um, 
you know, being able to provide a family, even if you're, they're temporary, they're, it's temporary housing, uh, uh, an apartment with a kitchen, you know, these hotel styles will not have kitchens, you know, where they can cook. Um, I, I think that we can do better. Um, and I look forward to having more conversations as this move forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, now we will hear some questions from uh, Council Member uh, Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. Welcome, DCP. Uh, I have uh, three things that I want to get to. Um, the first thing I want to get to is that one of the findings required to secure the special permit reads, should use, should use, sh I'm sorry, such use will not impair the essential character or future use of development of the surrounding area. That's concerning in locations where uh, we have non-conforming uses that seem to have gathered up and clustered, let's say, like in North Brooklyn, where we have hotels um, that have popped up. Will we consider the essential character a hotel, a hotel character within a manufacturing district because they've come up? Um, we also, even though you seem to disagree, have nightclubs uh, in North Brooklyn that are also clustering. Would that be considered uh, an essential use? Um, I'm very concerned with your wording there. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily to give the city council some leeway to be able to dictate what the future of those sites look like. I think it's more giving you the opportunity to convert manufacturing space into uses that don't, don't necessarily conform. So, so that's the first concern that I have. And maybe instead of essential character, we should consider calling it industrial character. We're talking about manufacturing here. We're talking about M1 zones. That's the name of the, the hearing. And I just don't necessarily feel like that essential character um, really speaks to protecting that. Um, the, the essential character um, finding is, is the language is pretty, actually pretty standard in many of our special permits, the wording. Um, and the M1 districts, although the, many of the in industrial business zones do have a very heavily industrial character, the M1 districts sort of by and large are much more mixed in terms of their character. There are districts in the Bronx, for instance, that are outside of IBZs that are hospital districts. These are places where a hotel is probably advisable and appropriate. Um, so I, I think as, because the M1 districts are, are, are so varied, we wanted to leave enough discretion for appropriate consideration of the context in which that hotel was being built. And it's not always just an industrial character. Right, so, so I guess that this is part of my second concern, is that it doesn't seem like you have any consistent uh, or uniform policy um, or, or planning rationale for how we should be treating manufacturing districts in general. Where I really feel like whether it's uh, this hotel special permits, whether it's the uh, self storage, uh, whether it's you know whenever we can get the Brooklyn or North Brooklyn uh, industrial study done, it seems like it's piecemeal. And given that you know this is called the Department of City Planning, it just feels like maybe there's not a lot of planning happening that's comprehensive and you and, and just. Um, bringing everything together to really speak to manufacturing as a whole. Instead, we'll have three, four hearings to talk about each part that you're working on independent of another. Um, and if that's not the case, we would love to hear um, this you know, more thoughtful, uh, again, cohesive planning rationale for how manufacturing is working because um, what you're saying about hotel special permits here, I don't think is consistent with other parts of your rationale, and I'll give an example of that. Um, is, it is nightlife. Uh, you don't seem to believe that it's a, it's, it's a, you know, bubbling up or it's a concern now. I just don't understand how fads or trends tend to dictate what your policy related to manufacturing is going to be as opposed to just having sound planning rationale. Like, why not just do something that makes sense for manufacturing or for what you want to do? Not, oh, well, that's not really hot right now, so we don't need to worry about it. Uh, if we look at what happened in the meatpacking district, what's happening in Williamsburg, uh, nightlife has completely taken over manufacturing districts there and made them useless um, or, or made them difficult to, to run. Boar's Head threatened to leave in the past in my district. Uh, we have, uh, the, I think, the last meatpacking company le um, leaving uh, the meatpacking district, so there won't be any more meatpacking happening in the district. Um, and it's just, why not just have something that's straight up 
policy rationale, not speaking to fads or trends. Maybe you are the ones that uh, should, you know, consider, uh, I guess, uh, establishing the fads or trends. What do you want to see come out of this? And maybe your policy dictates that, not necessarily the, the private folks. I hope that made some sense. Yeah, yes, that made sense. Would you like me to respond? <laughs> yes, please. Um, I agree that the M1 zoning is is out, outdated, um, and in many cases, in this, the, from 1961, and the city's economy is is an entirely different place. I mean, 1961 was the madman era, right? And it's it's a different it's a different time and different place. We and the self storage and hotel special permits were important commitments to address more immediate concerns. Um, that these areas were evolving in ways that were not anticipated, and we felt that we needed to address this right away. I do agree that it would be good to, to have a, a longer-term vision about how these places can evolve, um, not just for manufacturing, but for a number of uses, and how can these things coexist um, in a city that where everything is growing. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy, and we want to get it right. There we got some things wrong in 1961 that, that we still need to fix, um, and it you know, it takes time, and for something like, I think to, to your question about nightlife, not that there might not be, there are concerns and there, there, there could be good reasons to do that. Um, when we have a change like, this, but nightlife itself is also an important industry in the city, and we need to think about where it goes um, and where it can have room to grow. Um, so when we did the hotel text amendment, for instance, we, we did a pretty thorough assessment of what the effect of this action would be on the industry. Um, we would likewise need to think hard about where nightlife can go. Um, and so th these are, are, are not questions we take lightly because they have significant effects and long-term effects. Right, but we've been in the de Blasio administration for five years and you still haven't been able to put forth, uh, again, a rationale or, or a policy that speaks to where nightlife should go, right? Like that's my concern is that we talk about the want to preserve or assist manufacturing where it's thriving, but we can't necessarily seem to come together to put something that makes sense for the future of manufacturing. Now, I agree, nightlife needs to be somewhere. I would love for you to tell me where you think that should be and why, so that we can start having that conversation and protect that as well. I have no problem with that. I think that that's fair, mm -hmm. but why it takes so long for DCP, the Department of City Planning, to come up with these, these, these ideas is just beyond me. Um, and uh, when you look at what we would consider the symptoms of uh, inappropriate uses as, as it pertains to hotels, uh, they are almost uh, identical to the symptoms of uh, nightlife. Um, it's uh, what, what type of uh, uh, traffic we're going to be seeing for people having to go into core industrial locations to go and party. Um, right, it's, a, it's almost, a, I feel, a, a hotel and a nightlife establishment, and more so intrusive a nightlife establishment than, than a, a hotel. But in one side it makes sense for you, or you make sense of it, and in another you don't, because you want to be able to preserve nightlife to some degree. So it's like the rationale applies in this case, but not in this case. Um, and and we, just, we just don't put it together. It just, it's all just thrown out piece by piece by piece by piece. And I think that you guys are hurting the long-term viability of manufacturing that's working, like in North Brooklyn. So I just really hope that, uh, you know, the Department of City Planning gets to planning and put something together that makes sense so that we could all review and hopefully see a, a better future for manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Council Member Reynoso. I now uh, will turn it over to uh, Council uh, Member Rivera. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you, Chair Moya. To get an idea, uh, an understanding of, of the amount of hotels that are coming to our city, about how many rooms do you think are in the pipeline? I'll let Jackie answer this. I can't think of the exact number on top of my head. Is it okay if I get back to you on the exact number later? Sure, yeah, okay. Just because, you know, uh, this is clearly something you're conveying as important. I don't, if, I don't know if I could go as far to say as urgent, so I figured you would have somewhat of an idea of how much construction is on its way, but if you could get back to me, I would, I would really appreciate it. 
years. So what amount of time, and I did see, of course, the ULERP, and you mentioned um, your comment on two years, but what amount of time generally does a hotel special permit add to a developer's timeline? The, I mean, the process time is typically two years. I mean, there's an environmental review process and then the, the mandated clock for the, the land use review process. Um, I mean, it really d it depends on the development, you know, how, how large it is and where it is and whether it's mixed with other uses. Um, but how about a minimum? Approximate? I don't, I, I don't know. I don't actually know the answer to that question, but I know that two years is tip the typical sort of process time to get through a special permit process. Can you, this is kind of a two-part question because I have a real life example of something that recently happened in my district. Mm -hmm. Can you list the, the other types of special permits that would preempt a developer from having to seek this particular hotel sp special permit? And why I ask is in M15A and M15B districts, which is like the Soho, NoHo area, what is the applicability of requirements for the following special permit? So first I'd like to know what other types of permits could possibly preempt the HSP. Mm -hmm. And then in these districts specifically, the applicability of requirements for the following special permits. 74-781, 74-711, and 74-712. Jackie, do you want to cover that? Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, um, in, in the 5A, 5B, Soho, no area, we actually specifically put in language in the zoning text to explain um, which special permit or other um, zoning laws would actually supersede the M1 hotel special permit. The ground floor, um, ground floor marketing, a good faith marketing provision, which I believe is 74, 781, um, you would actually have to seek that special permit alongside of the M1 hotel special permit. Whereas for 74, 711, which is a landmark preservation uh, special permit, you could, a developer could choose either to go um, and obtain a special permit from the landmark preservation or um, seek um, the M1 hotel special permit. So, either so or. it's either or, yeah. Uh -huh. And 74 712? Did you mention that one already? I heard you say that's seven, also, eight, oh, that, That's it's, also the landmark. Okay, both, yeah. either or. Mm -hmm. So what other, and then to my question, are there other types of special permits that would supersede HSP or have the give the developer the choice to choose one or the other? There are some special districts in the city that already have a hotel special permit. They, in those special, those existing special permits would apply in those districts. So we, um, you mentioned earlier the, the potential impacts on a neighborhood, the traffic, you know, with the hotel traffic, the impact of small business. Um, so in terms of scrutiny of those potential impacts and then evidence provided in an application, are there other permits that would set a higher bar than the hotel special permit? I don't know if I would, I would call it a higher bar. There are some that are just different, which is I think the, the one that really the significant one was the M15A and M15B with the good faith marketing, which is why it's actually writ explicitly written into the text that the findings of those special permits must still be met if you are pursuing the M1 hotel special permit. So the notion was not to get you out of some existing sort of review or, or intent that exists for a development in, in overlapping areas today. So. Okay, um, well, if you could get back to me with the, with the other numbers, I would really appreciate it. Of and course. Uh, thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member uh, Rivera. Um, uh, I wanna thank you very much for your testimony here today. Um, we look forward to having uh, a continuing uh, dialogue uh, as uh, we keep going forward. Uh, but thank you very much for uh, coming here today. Great, thank you. Thank you. Armando Moritz. I'm sorry, I couldn't make out the the last name. Alan Friedman. Uh, Robin Kramer.
Uh, before the panel starts, uh, we just want to uh, continue our vote. Uh, Levin. Aye on all. The land use items are approved by a vote of seven in the affirmative, no negatives and no abstentions, and refer to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, if you can uh, just state your name and, and you can begin. Two minutes, right? Two minutes, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Moya and Councilmember Rivera uh, and the members who are formerly here from the uh, Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Armando moritz Japelikin. I am the Senior Economic Development Organizer with the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, also known as ANHD. Um, I'll be relatively quick. I provided copies of my written testimony as well as a report that our coalition released this morning. Um, as a part of the Industrial Jobs Coalition, which is a citywide alliance of policy advocates, community organizations, and business service providers, we broadly support the text amendment to restrict hotels in M1 areas across the city. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, some similar to the ones that had been flagged in the Q&A earlier to DCP, um, but just to touch on some of those points, um, I'll just go through my testimony quickly. Um, the special permit criteria specifically, the language around essential character, as Councilmember Reynoso had noted, uh, should be strengthened, specifically to consider how a proposed development would impact the real estate market in that area. I think that there's been broad recognition both with advocates as well as in the City Council and the administration that the reason why we're doing this is really to, to prevent speculation, to prevent the loss of industrial manufacturing jobs, and so we should be a lot more intentional and blunt about that in our zoning text. Um, moving along with the pur public purpose exemption, uh, previously the public purpose exemption, the language had been a lot broader. Uh, we support the added clarity that has been um, included with the newest language that specifically states that a transient hotel operated exclusively for the public purpose of temporary housing assistance um, provides a lot more clarity to this. Um, and with my remaining time, I just want to quickly pivot quickly, and I'd be happy to answer questions on this. As I had mentioned at the very beginning, our coalition, uh, the Industrial Jobs Coalition, re released a report card this morning, um, specifically f framing the administration's progress on its industrial action plan. Uh, the reason I flagged that for this conversation today is because use group reform was part of that conversation, and I think it's one that we need to continue as we look at the next three years beyond, um, based off of where we've been right now. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, turn your microphone on. We're good? Yep. Good morning. I'm Adam Friedman. I'm the director of the Pratt Center for Community Development, and I've submitted written testimony. But rather than read through that, I thought what would be more useful is to go through a copy of the, the report that we did a couple of years ago on hotel development, because I think it addresses a lot of the questions that you've been raising uh, during this hearing. And what the report does is shows why unregulated hotel development really conflicts in many places with city policy and undermines city policy. So if you just go to page three, in the first chart, it shows where hotel development is in fact conflicting with articulated city policy, either because it's an IBZ or because it's a 197A or other approved designations in those communities. It also shows you what the pipeline looks like, and there have been a number of questions ab about the, the pipeline for hotel development. And then if you turn to the bar graphs on pages, um, on pages six and seven, what we tried to do there was to show the profitability of hotel development in contrast to other uses. And there were a number of questions that you, you've asked about how is this going to impact the tourism industry? Is this going to curtail the development of hotels? And I think what this shows is they're cash cows, and they can outbid virtually any other use. So wherever they're allowed, they can outbid residential development, they can outbid office development, they can outbid a whole variety of other uses. So the concern that somehow this is going to choke off the tourism industry, I think, is, is refuted by just the financing, the, finance, the return on investment of hotels. So I think these graphics here and the analysis behind them would be no different Cer certainly for self-storage, but for superstores, for entertainment venues, for non-ancillary office uses, some of the other issues that you've raised and that we think should also be regulated through special permit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moy and Council Just push the button to turn your microphone on. 
Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya and Council Members. My name is Robin Kramer. I'm from Duval and Stackenfeld, and I'm here on behalf of 26 West 39th LLC, the owner of the property at 26 West 39th Street in Manhattan, located between 5th and 6th Avenues, right behind, or a couple buildings behind Lord & Taylor, where my client is developing a 299-room boutique hotel with restaurant and bars. We are here to ask the Council to extend the vesting date from April 23rd to the date the text change is approved. My client began assembling the lots and air rights for the hotel in 2014, long before the city first released a proposal to put the special permit in all zoning districts, in all M1 zoning districts. It obtained its zoning approval in February 2018, its foundation permit in July, and its NB permit yesterday. Although my client's been working actively since it got its permits, it will not have completed its foundations or even its excavations, and therefore cannot take advantage of the zoning resolution vesting provisions. If the vesting date is not changed and my client is unable to vest, then my client will have to cease construction. It may be able to get common law vesting, but that is not guaranteed. If the project does not vest, my client will have lost four years of work and all the money spent, obviously. But the city will have also lost. This hotel would employ approximately 200 construction workers with 300 people in the hotel, operations, food service, and related industries, and an annual tax loss of about $5 million. The New York State Comptroller's Office has stated that the leisure and hospitality industry accounted for one-fifth of the city's job growth since 2009. City planning report says the text change is needed to ensure that hotels don't conflict with adjoining uses and don't detract from industrial, commercial, and institutional uses. But in mid-Manhattan, industrial use is not happening, and there is plenty of room for commercial and institutional growth in the new areas in Hudson Yards, Midtown East, and even possibly the Garment Center. The biggest competition would obviously be residential uses, which is not permitted. The EIS assumed there would be no reduction in the number of hotels, but it didn't really study the impact of the tax change on either tourism or Airbnb. Given the cost, time, and uncertainty of the special permit, that assumption is unwarranted. Um, just finishing up, my clients invested significant sums of money and should be allowed to continue construction where there's no evidence that a special permit is needed in mid-Manhattan to limit construction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, your testimony here today. I will now call up the next panel. Uh, Scott Schneider. Is that M burst? 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 Jeff, we have Mulligan. Yep. Okay. Great. You may begin. Testing. Testing. Thank you. My name is Scott Schneider. I'm the Chief Future Development Officer of Autobach Healthcare. Autobach Healthcare is the global leader in prosthetics and neuroorthopedics. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for your time, your interest, and mostly for your interest to serving the public. We feel very uh, aligned with that. Our mission, we're a 100-year-old company, and really our mission is totally dedicated to the public as well, is to help those with mobility issues regain their mobility and challenge uh, their mobility cha challenges to prosper. What we're here to ask for today is, this, is to be grandfathered from this uh, uh, zoning text, zone, uh, the new text, if you would. And we feel very strongly that this uh, project is going to help the community. For example, uh, we believe that we'll have more than 60 jobs. Just we have that. spoke with the Navy Yard CEO, and this will be uh, supporting the manufacturing, and we will have a multi-use um, facility. But also, this facility will bring in veterans. We do a lot of work with the Department of Defense and with Capitol Hill the war, uh, Wounded Warriors uh, project. Uh, we will have diplomats coming in to learn about the project. 
Uh, we'll focus on education of all of those previously mentioned, but also with the community on looking at prosthetics and orthotics. It's probably the first time many of you have ever heard or seen a, a prosthetic device in use. So again, our ask is that we'd like to be grandfathered and we would like to show you briefly what the project is. So first of all, it's about public education. It's an awareness of prosthetics and orthotics. Most people don't know what it is. And the second use is that we will be building a clinic that will be open also for the local uh, community and for medical tourism. And finally, the hotel will create the financial awareness. Thank you. Um, so to give you a status of the project, the foundation and excavation plan was approved and we're ready to pull the permit any minute now. Uh, demolition is being prepared, but we believe that we won't be able to get uh, full excavation and substantial um, foundation in time the, by the time the tax amendment is approved. Um, I think if you want to look at page six, um, tells you a little bit about the concept of the hotel with, um, with the facility. And then as well as page nine gives you a good idea how it's going to fit into the neighborhood and how it's going to benefit the neighborhood. And then page 14 gives you, well, maybe you want to talk about that. 14 is we have perched, or we have built this before. You can see the one that we had built in Berlin. And this focuses on the education piece and also what the property looks like. Um, it's right next to the US Embassy on Potsdamer Platz. But um, more so what it, it also showed us is we learned that there was no, not enough revenue to sustain this and therefore we are learning or applying those lessons learned to this um, proposal in Brooklyn. Um, if you go, sorry, uh, if you look at 15, that's the state of development. Obviously it's not, um, the design is not finalized and 16 as well, and then on page 20, mm -hmm. um, it gives, okay. Go ahead, it you gives can you an finish idea. up. Yeah, it gives you an idea on the design as well as the square of What page was that? 20. Mm -hmm. And we also added a timeline, so to give you an idea how fast we could also apply for the full billing application. Okay, thank you. Sure. So j just to be clear, so the, the hotel use would be an auxiliary use because the, the, the primary driver of this project is, is for, you said clinic and, and uh, showroom for, and full disclosure, we've met before, but yeah. Uh, orthotics and, um, and, uh, and, and prosthetics. prosthetics. Yeah, so, so basically, um, and thank you, two minutes is really difficult. <laughs> um, basically what the concept is is that we are educating both the community because the education of prosthetics, it's like the pilots right now. We're having a big problem. The, the baby boomers are coming through. There's not enough clinicians to serve. So one portion of this is to educate uh, the entire United States and the community, but locally also to serve. And then to also have an actual orthotic and prosthetic clinic, it would be a Medicare number and a Medicaid number, so we would be seeing both local patients mm -hmm. with limb loss and mobility concerns, as well as um, medical tourism. This is a highly specialized area. The hotel gives another element because for example, a wounded warrior that has uh, upper limb prostheses, you're the abduction that's required is different for each person based on their injuries. Mm -hmm. And we build different knobs, different handles, different um, 
door openings and activities of daily life that people can utilize and we can do that right in this hotel setting as well they would stay there and people and people travel long distances in order to go to a specific clinic for for orthotics and and uh, prosthetics is that right they do they there's uh, the VA for example the Veterans Administration uh, of all of their billing they're only able to handle 20 percent of their of what the VA pays for within VA centers. So it requires a lot of people to be, have to travel to areas, but of certain um, levels of education as well, people will travel to a different state or even country. Okay, thank you very much. For thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya and Council Members. Uh, my name is Jeff Mulligan. I'm a Planning and Development Specialist with the law firm of Kramer Levin, which is representing 81 Beaver Street, LLC, the owner of an individual landmark located in Bushwick, Brooklyn. 81 Beaver Street is a four-story building built in the late 19th century for the Ulmer Brewery. The building was designated an individual landmark in 2010 and is largely vacant and in urgent need of restoration. As you know, individual landmarks are not candidates for demolition and redevelopment given their landmark status. Like many historic, formerly industrial buildings, 81 Beaver Street has narrow floor plates with column spacing that makes it ill-suited for adaptive reuse by an as-of-right modern manufacturing or office tenant. However, it is suitable for a small hotel, which does not require large floor plates. Unfortunately, a special permit requirement for a hotel of this size is not a viable option for our client because the Euler process is both lengthy and costly. By preventing the as-of-right conversion of a small landmark building, such as 81 Beaver Street, to boutique hotel use, the text amendment could inadvertently discourage the restoration and preservation of landmark buildings. We urge the City Council to create, to create an exemption from the requirement for a hotel special permit for individual landmark properties located in M1 districts. We believe that the exemption should apply to landmark buildings that contain floor area of 60,000 square feet or less and are located outside of Manhattan. These buildings are more vulnerable as they are generally too small for conversion to permitted office and retail uses, and they are located outside of the city's main business districts where reinvestment for commercial use is more likely. We also note that allowing uh, the as of right conversion of these buildings to hotels would not impair neighborhood character, which is a goal of the text amendment. To the contrary, the conversion of a landmark building would help maintain neighborhood character by facilitating the restoration and preservation of struggling landmark buildings. Uh, just to finish up, I have provided the list of landmarks for the committee that would be uh, affected by the proposed amendment, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have a uh, follow-up question from uh, Council Member uh, Levin. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry to the uh, Audubon uh, presenters. Can you can you share with us just really quickly the uh, the square footage of hotel use, hotel use and the square footage of of the um, medical use? So the medical use is going to be approximately six thousand square feet, um, and the hotel. Just a second. Yeah, like 4,000. And then, and not the hotel, sorry, the restaurant. Okay. And the hotel is going to be the rest. So if you look at the um, hotel use, so it's around um, 36,000 square feet. 36, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your testimony today. Uh, I will call up the next panel which is uh, Daryl Holler and Maria Roca. Are we ready? We're ready. 
Good morning, Chairman Moria and members of the New York City Council Subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Daryl Holland, and I manage two industrial business zones in Brooklyn East. And uh, I'm going to cut right to the chase because I only got two minutes. Um, the, proliferation, the proliferation of, of uh, hotels in the Brooklyn East service area mandates an in-depth special permit to place checks and balances on any future development in the M1 zones. There are many reasons. I'm going to point out just one. This is the crux of my testimony. It will probably take three or four minutes, but I've got to get this paragraph in. A graphic example of this can be found at the edge of, East New of the East New York Industrial Business Zone at 268-272 Williams Avenue. Unbeknownst to much of the community, this site is now under hotel construction. Uh, no, hotel construction. Earlier this year, an anonymous Roslyn, New York-based company filed applications for two East New York IBZ-located properties totaling over 51,000 square feet to erect two four-story hotels. Most disturbing is that half a block south of these two, uh, of the, of these two properties is a bustling residential community with one of the highest unemployment rates in the borough. In, in, in all of New York, 11.2 percent, according to the American Community Survey figures, almost three times the New York City's 4.2 percent unemployment rate. In comparison, unemployment figures for this area from other sources range from 12.5 to 17.9 percent. The loss of this property to hotel development negates the opportunity for industrial development that could conceivably support 25 or more well-paying manufacturing jobs. In sum, this will be a loss to an East New York community that suffers from a devastatingly high unemployment rate and opportunities uh, limited to low-paying jobs. Along with the restrictions of self-storage facilities passed by the Council in December, the proposed restrictions to hotel construction and manufacturing zones as part of New York City's 2015 Industrial Action Plan, which aims to preserve the integrity of industrial areas. We support these policies, but I think to honor, to honor this commitment, the city should also be advancing more stringent group reforms in industrial areas. And in closing, establishing a, a special permit for hotel development and manufacturing zones is yet another step towards dissuading encroachment of competing uses that crowd quality jobs and job intense for job intensive industrial firms. This must be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Good morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council and fellow New Yorkers. I am Maria Roca, resident of Sunset Park, longtime resident at that, and founder of the Friends of Sunset Park. Uh, founder of the to advocate, uh, we were founded to advocate for the preservation and restoration of our namesake park, working industrial waterfront, as well as the upland. I am here also as a member of POWA, which stands for preserving our working waterfront alliance. Um, I come before you to speak about the proposed M1 hotel text amendment requiring a special permit uh, of siting a hotel in an M1 zone property. We have been living with that nightmare for decades already. So um, too many um, disruptions are many, major disruptions um, are many when hotels are sited in M1 zones or, or adjacent and that are adjacent particularly to residential areas and manufacturing areas, or, le or sometimes even just commercial areas. Uh, Sunset Park is one of those seriously and negatively impacted neighborhoods. While New York City is way overdue for a measured process to siting hotels in M1 zones, as well as areas neighboring M1 zones, um, what is being proposed needs tighter controls, as well as allowing for an immediate moratorium on all future hotels in areas with existing oversaturation of hotels. Um, beyond citywide considerations, neighborhoods must be evaluated individually. Sunset Park is one of those oversaturated areas where hotels and other zoning loopholes have vandalized our family-friendly community. Speaking of Hotchiss Hotels, as referred by Cher Salamanca, um, Sunset Park already has 13, 13 of them within a two-mile square area, further facilitating existing and growing human trafficking activities. There are six hot sheets hotels alone on 39th Street between 4th and 9th Avenues, with active and flagrantly visible prostitution-type human trafficking. These six hotels share blocks with the residential buildings. And um, if I may just go a small paragraph. Um, 
We haven't heard anything here today on the negative impact that neighborhoods like Sunset Park are already experiencing. We know we're not alone in New York City. What about the public safety? The burden on our first responders, particularly the NYPD and FDNY, when these hotels behave badly for the many reasons, many ways they do. Environmental and climate change, clean water and sewage demands, as well as building in flood zones, traffic congestion, access to near, nearby hospitals as hotels attract la large numbers of patrons inebriated on their way home. And I should, I could add, which will be I, my we, we have to written testimony, up. and I appreciate the, I appreciate the consideration. It, yes. Thank you. You can finish. That's you, it. That was it? Okay. Well, it, it will be longer than that will be in the written. Okay. I would just <laughs> elaborate on all those issues. Great. We have great experience in that. We can speak from personal experience in our neighborhood. Okay, great. Thank, Th you. thank you both for uh, your testimony <coughs> here today. Thank you very much. Uh, we will call up uh, the last panel. Uh, oh man. Paimon Lodi. Gene Kaufman, Evan Weiss, and Paul uh, Foshi, 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 I don't know. We may begin. Good morning, Chair Moya, fellow council members. My name is Payman Lothi, uh, Senior Vice President with the Real Estate Board of New York. I'm here today to offer our testimony. Uh, Remney strongly opposes the proposed M1 Hotel Tax Amendment that would significantly limit as of right hotel, hotel development citywide. It has been the experience of our members that the requirement of a special permit has been a deterrent to new hotel development and the draft scope of work states that the proposal will limit the land area of Azerite Hotel development by 45%. The proposal claims that the zoning in the M1 districts gives hotels a competitive advantage over most other permitted uses and detracts from opportunities for other kinds of development. Yet there is insufficient data to support those claims and in fact the market shows that this is not the case. Over the course of the past few years, the city has often applied a hotel special permit on both public and private applications throughout the city, including central locations like East Midtown and the Garment District, where hotel development should be encouraged. Rather than continuing with this piecemeal and opaque approach to regulating new hotels, the city should state its position on as of right hotel development. Further, the city needs to undertake a comprehensive study of the impact of recent land use actions on the hotel industry, instead of the segmented analysis provided in the city's hotel study. We have outlined a you know, series of proposed modifications. Um, one is to exclude areas with existing special uh, permit provisions, exclude Manhattan from the hotel special permit, consider an alternative based on the number of room keys, and limit the special permit on, data, on, on a date certain. Um, the hotel industry is a critical linchpin of our city's tourism economy, and it is vital that hotel development not be constrained. The proposed action in this is an unnecessary constraint on the rights of property owners to address a market condition that needs no correction and appears to be motivated by factors unrelated to sound planning. Thank you. It is unclear why the city is advancing a proposal that would impose heavy restrictions on hotel development, and the hotel study submitted fails to make a case for its need. We respectfully request that the city council not support this zoning proposal in its current form. Thank you. Thank you. Ch Chairman Moya and members of the zoning subcommittee, I am Gene Kaufman, principal at Gene Kaufman Architect. We have designed 83 hotels with over 18,000 hotel rooms in New York City. 
nearly 40% are in M1 zones. These hotels contribute to New York City's economy in many, many ways, creating hundreds of construction jobs, thousands of operational jobs, and untold additional jobs for nearby businesses that support them. They help drive our local economy through tourism and business travel, thus supporting the vibrancy of businesses and the arts citywide. Hotels play a critical role in making New York City the leading global city. So it is extremely unfortunate that our city's hospitality sector will be so damaged by this text amendment. The risk, time, and cost of a special permit for a hotel in M1 zones will certainly halt all such development. The council's uh, action will slash by 45% the available land, but nonetheless, hotels are only occupying less than 1% of that land. Why would the council want to constrain supply, drive up the cost of visiting the city, and incentivize the use of Airbnb as a hotel alternative? My submitted testimony explains in detail the harmful effects of constricting the hotel supply. Suffice it to say that this will immeasurably damage the city's economy and its reputation. Should the council proceed with this text amendment, I respectfully request it amend the vesting provision to protect those who have made financial obligations from having their rights taken due to zoning action by the council. The current proposed three-year period to complete with a permit by April 23rd, eight months ago, is, is unfair to people who obtained permits after this date. Therefore, at a minimum, the council should change the vesting date to the December date of the council vote. Other very advisable recommendations include, one, placing a sunset date on this amendment to phase it out, and two, eliminating, I'm just you finished one. Time. Okay eliminating Manhattan's M1 from the change altogether, which is listed as a city planning uh, proposal alternative. Since these uh, zones in Manhattan are, are so unlikely to be used for manufacturing purposes in, in the future. The majority of M1 hotels, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, have room rates of under $150 a night and allow ordinary middle-class people to visit a city that will not be able to visit if this amendment passes. Special permits have previously been created in Tribeca and East Midtown and other areas. There have been zero applications for the hotel special permit. The record shows special permits for hotels mean no hotels. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having us here. Um, Paul Fasci, principal with OmniBuild Construction. OmniBuild is one of the largest hotel builders in New York City. And I wanted to just present for you today a few facts and, and figures to understand and underscore what Mr. Kaufman said and, and my other colleagues about how we can't understate the economic impact of hotel construction in New York, in New York enough. Uh, the typical hotel project in New York City employs anywhere between 200 and 250 workers per day, typically for a period of about two years. We hire dozens of sub subcontractor firms, which are small businesses here in New York City, who hire from their communities. And as everyone is aware, there's a very, very tight labor market at this point, due in no small part to the amount of construction going on in New York. So economically, the people of New York have benefited because of this construction and will continue to do so as long as people are able to develop within the legal limits of, of the M1 and other, other districts. Um, statistics that we've seen recently, we add 5% per year in hotel rooms in New York City consistently over the last seven years. Room rates, occupancy rates remain close to 90%. So the consumption and the demand is, is evident. Um, to underscore what Mr. Kaufman said earlier, less than 1% of the available land in the M1 zone is used for hotel usage. Up to 16% of that land is vacant, unused. The perception that there's a lack of land available in the M1 districts for manufacturing uses, I think, is a little backwards. There's a lack of demand for manufacturing uses in those zones. There's not a lack of space. So again, even with the, the emphasis that uh, Gene put forth about special permits, of the 12 million square feet available to hotels with a special permit, zero applications have been filed to get a special permit because developers know that, that they won't take that risk and it is what they do. They are in the business of risk at times. Um, so basically, my, my point is that there is a tremendous economic boost to New York City economy as a result of the hotel work that has been steadily going on through the 90s and into the 2000s. And to curtail it because of a, uh, I think, 
well-intended but misplaced view of the of the spatial constraints is is a mistake so we're opposed to this text change thank you thank you uh, good morning, Chairman Moya and members of the Zoning Subcommittee. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak today. My name is Evan Weiss. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Principal with LW Hospitality Advisors. We are exclusively focused on the hospitality and gaming spaces. We provide valuation, advisory, consulting services, inclusive of appraisals, feasibility studies, market studies, and other consulting and advisory type of uh, reports and assistance to hotel owners, operators, developers, lenders across the country. Uh, our firm produced a report that explores the historical and prospective economic trends of the New York City hotel and tourism market and the potential unintended economic and social impacts for various New York City stakeholders if the proposed special permit to limit new hotel development in M1 zoning districts is adopted by the New York City Council. While some of the DCP's arguments presented in the M1 hotel text amendment draft scope of work for an environmental impact statement dated September 27, 2017 may have merit, the report's conclusions largely rely on unsupported assumptions. Overall, the report and the analysis fail to consider the repercussions from artificially restricting hotel development in M1 zoning districts. The report which we have provided to the committee concludes that the proposed special permit zoning change restricting new hotel development in M1 zones is at best misguided. The hotel and tourism industries have historically been a vital part of the city's economy, generating hundreds of thousands of jobs, billions of dollars in tax revenue, and over $64 billion in direct and, un and indirect economic impact in 2016 alone. Despite hotel owners experiencing the negative effects of additional competition um, in the form of reduced rates and sometimes reduced um, net operating income and profit, New York City is anticipated to continue to achieve increased economic and social benefits from hotel and tourism growth. Although restricting hotel development in M1 zones is not anticipated to reduce historical contributions of the industry, it is projected that restricting M1 hotel de development will reduce the potential economic and social benefits to the city in the long term. For these reasons, we believe that current action plan uh, by the City Council to adopt the CPC special permit yeah, finish. You can, thank you. Uh, for new hotel development in M1 zones to be imprudent, and we respectfully request that it should not be adopted in the near future. Um, I, I would uh, just venture one more point. Um, you know, the a closing thought would be that you know, the revenue mentioned early on in this process um, when, when the announcement uh, of the zoning, change, text, uh, the zoning change was that instead of disincentivizing uh, hotel use, uh, if, if we really care about manufacturing um, and creating jobs in that way, why don't we re-incentivize and potentially even increase uh, opportunities uh, for manufacturing with increased FAR bonuses and things of that nature. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Are there any other members of the public who wish to uh, testify? Seeing none, I now close this public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Um, thank you. Uh, this concludes today's meeting and I would like to thank the members of the public, uh, my colleagues, uh, and of course uh, the great staff uh, and council uh, at uh, Land Use um, for attending uh, today's uh, hearing. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you.